Vernomatic Productions. Are you ready? Live from the Metal Mayhem Studios in Rochester, New York. We are gold. We are gold. And heard around the world by metalheads just like you. This is Metal Mayhem ROC. Heavy metal music. Your weekly dose of metal music. Interviews, album reviews, news, and more. Want to be part of the show? Send us a message through our website, MetalMayhemROC.com. Or hit us up on Facebook and Twitter. Search Metal Mayhem ROC. A proud member of the Pantheon podcast team. It's getting nice and heavy. Now, welcome our hosts, John the Vernomatic Verno, and direct from New Jersey, Metal Walt. Good evening, everyone. Metal Walt here, calling in from Jersey. I'm with my partner, Southern Cal. It's almost the beginning of summer, and we're here to jump into the world of power metal. Speaking of guitars, Mark Brody of Jag Panzer, who is about to release their 11th studio album and their first one in six years called The Hallowed. It's a killer one, and he's here to join us to talk about the band and the new album and plans for touring over the summer. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Well, uh, congratulations on the new album, The Hallowed. We really uh, enjoy that one, and we're going to get into that uh, today. But first, I'd like to introduce you to my partner here, Southern Cal. Hello, Mark. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Um, this is gonna this is gonna be good. This is a great new album we're going to be discussing here, The Hallowed. It's just top to bottom, great new album coming out June twenty third. Hey, thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, excited for people to hear it. It was it was fun writing and recording it, and we're all very proud of it. So, uh, yeah, excited for everybody to hear it. So, all Mark, right. we uh, we got a little news. Uh, so, uh, a news came through our broadcast booth this morning, and uh, I don't know if you were up late last night watching the basketball game, but check out what we found today in our Metal Mayhem ROC mailbox. <laughs> I mean, isn't this amazing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, the kid's got a Jack Panzer hat on. I mean, you know, yeah. come on now, right? Yep, I know that's world champions. I think yeah, everybody's you, uh, excited here in Colorado. I think this is their first ever championship, correct? It is the first, yeah. In it's fact, uh, since we started recording the Hallowed and before we released it, we've had two championships here in Colorado: Avalanche last year and Nuggets this year. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Well, congratulations to the state of Colorado and the town of Denver because it's not often that you can have an interview with a metal band celebrating a championship of a professional sport. But that's uh, that's pretty cool. So hey. Uh, yeah. Hey, Mark, before we get into uh, the new album, we had a couple little th- comments or questions for you. So okay. we were reading a little bit, and I know you have a long history with Harry Conklin that you guys go back decades. But uh, there was a, a note that said that he actually taught you how to play guitar. Is that accurate? And and was it God of Thunder, the Kiss song that actually you guys learned first? Yeah, yeah that's true. Harry grew up six houses up from me, so I, I met him and... Uh our bass player, John, um, I guess I was six and they were seven. And yeah, we just, we grew up hanging out all the time. And he actually got an electric guitar when he was 14. So I was 13 and he he was learning to play Kiss songs. And it just amazed me. I mean, I couldn't believe how cool that was. And uh, he actually joined a, a band back then with some older kids and he sang and he actually had girls interested in him, which was quite shocking for us at the time so yeah i i had to get an electric guitar so i got one from the pawn shop for 15 dollars. i mowed the yard for a month and my dad bought it for me and harry showed me how to play god of thunder and i i worked on it every day after school for probably about four days uh until i could play it it was very exciting for me how old were you guys around that time when this whole thing went down yeah he was 14 i was 13 do you remember the brand name of the guitar by any chance? No, it was some off. It was a horrible guitar. It was some weird off brand, uh, like a blue Stratocaster with a, a horrible neck that was warped and frets that cut my fingers and it wouldn't stay in tune. 
I think most of our first guitars came out of a pawn shop and they always look great until you got home and plugged that thing in and it sounded like shit. Yeah, this one sounded terrible, but I, I was excited. It was just so cool for me. That's uh, that's pretty cool. So was that the beginning basically of like your, let's call it like your musical collaboration? Is that where it all started? When you guys 14, 15? Yeah, yeah, because we, uh, you know, we'd always hung out together as friends. But yeah, him showing me a song, we could communicate musically really well. Um, we're usually on the same page with what songs should sound like and what we want to hear. And we, we take each other's criticism very well. You know, there's just no ego involved. We just both want to uh, do the best we can musically. So yeah, that was, that was the first time we knew we could really work together well in anything music related. Yeah, that's that's pretty awesome. I mean, that sounds like a, like a true, genuine friendship. More importantly than anything else, that you can, you know, be friends before, and then you come up with something that you turn into a whole career. And here it is, decades later, and you know, your bandmates and and still really good friends. So that's pretty pretty awesome. So hey, Mark, we also wanted to ask, and I know this has probably been asked to you a million times before, but for our listeners. Just the name of the band, can you just give us the description where that came from? We know it's about a tank, a German tank, but how did you guys come up with that name and, and where did it literally, what does it literally mean? Well, we were called Tyrant and we had sent out some demos and I actually got a nice letter back from Mike Varney from Shrapnel Records. He was a big guy in the underground back then. Well, I mean, he he's still that is, but he was... Yeah you know, one of the biggest players. And he took me time to write a letter. And he said, you guys sound like a, a talented young band, but you need a new name. There's a lot of different bands called Tyrant. So we had already been talking to Azra Records, who we signed with, and they came up with a bunch of names on a list. And each member of the band came up with a bunch of names. So we ended up with a list of about 50 band names. And we started, uh, you know, looking them up and looking into them. And, uh, I, I couldn't find anything on Jag Panzer at the library. And my dad said, well, it's Jag Panzer. There's a D in there because we we lived in Germany for several years and my dad was in the military. So he knew what that was. So we went to the library and looked it up and it was just massive, cool, impressive tank. So we thought, OK, this sounds really cool. And it also if we made it Jag Panzer, it sort of reminded us of Led Zeppelin. It was sort of a weird weird heavy sounding name so that's how we decided on that yeah that, uh, that that's pretty cool yeah i appreciate you uh clearing that up so uh hey before we get into the the hallowed because we have uh we really want to hear from you about the whole storyline behind this the characters and the songs themselves but one thing that um we found that was amazing is you guys went back in time and the way that you're doing your promotions these days was is just it's so damn cool i actually called the number i was guilty of it last week i called <laughs> it up and i heard harry screaming on it and um yeah man a hotline and you know th like the fan postcards the uh, you know you can mail it in and then the one on the kind of the bottom left it looks like you guys sent these kind of audio cards out to maybe the media or the press that kind of gave them a little heads up as to what was coming on this album so Talk a little bit about your conscious effort to go back into the old way of doing things. Yeah, we we had a band meeting and we decided we wanted to uh, try to give the fan experience of the 80s. And, and things were very different then. You know, everybody bought music. There's no online. You know, there was tape trading, which I was heavily involved in. But, you know, it didn't sound that good. If you like something, you ended up buying the vinyl. So everybody bought the vinyl. So bands were really try heavily into promotion. And so, uh, you know, a lot of bands had hotlines. Uh, there was a record store up in Northern California that did just, just did crazy mail order business called the Record Exchange. They had a hotline number I used to call. Um, bands would send out postcards. I know Iron Maiden had a um, Christmas card list. And if, man, if you got on that list, you were like, you were it. And <laughs> you showed up on the Iron Maiden list. So, we were thinking, you know, why don't bands do that today? Well, today is almost the opposite. It's it's a lot harder to make money in the music business. So 
you got bands that, uh, you know, are charging for meet and greets and photos and, Hey, you know, to each band his own, I'd never tell another band how to do their business, but we thought, well, let's, let's give people a taste of what it was like in the eighties. So let's do a hotline. Let's send out postcards to fans. Let's, um, do this audio car and send it to journalists. Let's just try to uh, do things differently because all the young music bands I talked to, they had no idea of this things happening in the eighties. I mean, I remember mentioning a hotline to anybody under 30 and they said, well, what's, what's a hotline that, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you call a number? And I said, well, there's no internet then. Right. So uh, we thought it would be a cool, uh, you know, a fun way to promote the hallowed. You know, Mark, I've watched a, a couple of videos and um, you've talked probably each each different video. You talked about your connection with the fans. Um, you were talking about uh, your friend had uh, gotten a deal on some dog tags, like 100 dog tags. Uh, Harry, where's the dog tags? And to throw them out to the fans and just picks by themselves. This hotline and this way of promoting the band, it I tell you, it 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 touches the fan more than any other thing I've really seen recently. It's a nice little touch. I think the fans totally appreciate it. I think every band needs a hotline. Every band should have one. Uh, Walt said he called it. I called it right away too. It was just, uh, <laughs> it was 1980 all over again. Cause like you said, we had no internet. We had a, a magazine, a couple magazines and like a local free time that would tell you about bands that were coming or the, your radio station. So to have stuff like this and uh, a number you can actually call and, and hear from a different band member uh, each message, it's, it's great. It's a it's a great way to connect with the with the fans, uh, truly with the fans. And I, I they appreciate it. And I think we appreciate your appreciation of the fans, if you understand what I'm saying there. Yeah, oh, I get it. And, you know, uh, to get a, an interest in what the fans like, I just... Look at what I like because I'm a metal fan too. I'm always going to gigs. Tonight I'm going to go see Blind Oath and Chamber Mage here in town. It's going to be a cool metal gig. So yeah, I just I'm, I'm trying to give the fans, I guess, what things I would like as a fan. You're in Colorado Springs, correct? Yes. Uh, what's the local venue that you're going to see them tonight at? I've actually I've never been to this venue. This is a uh, a bar in downtown Colorado Springs and it's it either operates as an upstairs downstairs bar or sometimes they have different shows downstairs so this is a downstairs gig I was there once for a wedding reception but otherwise I've never been to a show there so it's, it's going to be new for me let me ask you this back in the early days when you guys were um to getting your start in Colorado Springs there were there uh, was there any particular venue? I know you guys played a lot of shows and opened up for a lot of bands that came through town. Is that correct? Back in the day, yes. Um, what were some of the venues then? Well, there were two main venues for shows. There was a venue here in town called DJ's Nightclub, which you know we I was there so much. I'm, I should have got my mail there. It was you know, it was live yeah. bands every night. It was great bands. And it was usually a, a cover band, but they would have all the concerts there. I saw Metallica there, Slayer, Armored Saint. And then up in Denver, about 70 miles from us, there was a venue called the Rainbow Music Hall, which was, it was incredible. It was a theater size, great light show, great sound. We played there with Slade, uh, Grim Reaper. And then I also saw, um, I saw Merciful Fate there. I saw Exciter there. You know, sadly, they tore that down and turned it into a Walgreens. But that was an incredible venue. I, I have a friend. When I first moved to Florida, this is 1990, uh, on Friday nights, I'd bring some tapes into work. I put on Jag Panzer's Ample Destruction. And one of the cooks looks over at me and he's like, where the hell did you get this shit? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean how did you get this shit? I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, I didn't realize. I knew he was from Colorado. And I probably at the time didn't know that you guys were from Colorado and he grew up in Colorado Springs. He had, he had seen you probably 500 times. He said, opening for bands, playing, <laughs> or playing there. And I was just, I was so pissed off at him. He, I was like, dude, ample destruction. Are you kidding me? You don't like this? Get, 
get out of here, dude. You're not even a metalhead now. I, I can't even <laughs> believe you're dissing on Shag Panzer. And man, you know, after that, I uh, he he changed his ways again towards Jag Panzer. But you know, like I said, he probably saw oh, you good back in the day. And I just couldn't believe he would he just dissed on Jag Panzer like that. Just straighten him out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we played all the time here in town. Yeah, constantly. Let's do something fun, guys. Ready? I'm going to call the hotline. Let's see what comes up. <laughs> What's going on here? Thank you for calling the Jag Panzer hotline. You you have reached us just literally a few days before the Hallowed is released. This is Rickard Sternquist, and I'm excited beyond belief to be able to say that you guys are going to be able to hear this record that we've been working on for the past two years. And it has been an amazing process. It's been an amazing experience. And I think it really comes out in this record. And, and, and I'm so proud that every song stands on its own, but yet when you listen to this record in its entirety from beginning to end, make sure you listen to all the way to the end. It really has this amazing, amazing vibe. So, hey, this thing comes out June 23rd. We already have three singles out and a documentary. Please go to the Atomic Fire website. You can pre-order the U.S. version the bundle, all that good stuff there. You can also get it at Amazon Music, Apple Music, Spotify, and Deezer. Check out all the latest news at jagpanzer.com, and please visit the merch store. We got some great merch, and we'd love to see your support there. See you on tour. Awesome. Utterly yeah. awesome. That's a new one. I didn't hear uh, that one. I heard Harry last week, so that one just must have come up. <laughs> His cool. his English is flawless. He's uh, he's a Swedish citizen, and English is his second language. That was wow. pretty good. See, so just, hey, said. Mark, we want to get into the new album, but um, so a little bit about the concept. I, I want you to tell us about it, but you know, it sounds like it's uh, it's sort of like this post apocalyptic world, survivors and animals. It's like an adventure story. But what I found was kind of cool is the album is told from the point of view of the animals. Yet when you guys did the comic book prior to the album, that was actually told from the point of view of the humans. Correct. So talk a little bit about the whole concept yeah. of the storyline. Well, you know, we we knew we wanted to do a concept album. We had done one before on uh, Macbeth and that was fun. So we wanted to do that. So we were trying to come up with thinking about different concepts. And I was really adamant that I wanted a classic adventure story. I really grew up loving uh, movies like Jason and the Argonauts and Seventh Voyage of Sinbad and Clash of the Titans and Valley of Guanji and 20,000 Leagues, you know, just the classic Ray Harryhausen movie. So I wanted to do a classic uh, adventure story and we were throwing around some ideas and we sent a, you know, just a very rough outline to our singer and he came back with a full story. He's the one that added in the uh, the animals having different roles. And he's the one that suggested the dual viewpoint. So we just started rolling with it. His, his story was so fleshed out that I just asked him, can you break this up into song segments? And yeah, he did a great job of that. And I got to work on songwriting and I passed over my songs to our drummer and he got to work on doing some arrangements. Uh, adding real drums to my demos, working with vocals, uh, lead guitar, bass. And so he was sort of putting everything together while I was jumping on to the next song. But yeah, every, everybody got on board and really liked the uh, the concept story. So it was nice to see everybody, you know, full agreement on something like this. And I think you guys did, I, I got to say, going back to the old school promotional ways, you guys done a really good job. That mini documentary, which is, I think, all about 10, 12 minutes you know, it really captures the essence of this album and how it all came together, not just from the idea, but out as you guys, you know, introduced Ken to the band and then you did the recording itself and then how you went out and promoted the album. 
and the videos and how you plan on going out there eventually and packaging the item, putting out those great singles with great artwork and just those themselves have great artwork. So um, it's it's a real testament to you guys really thinking your your brand and your product through. So well done there. But talk a little bit about Ken. So as I understand it, he's been you know a member of the touring band for a lot of years now, but maybe he has never actually been involved in writing, songwriting. Um, I, I found that there was one cool picture that came in the documentary that it's similar to the one I'm showing on the screen where you guys are up in kind of looks like a, a roof of a house and there's stairs where the the other four of you guys are on one side and he's on the other. <laughs> and it almost reminded me, it was like, like a college hazing <laughs> thing. Like, was he going through his hazing period where you guys are like, you know <laughs> what, let's see what you got on the table writing and recording and you're going to stand over there and you're not an official member of the band until we say so. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's absolutely, there's a good natured hazing. Absolutely. <laughs> it's uh, funny. I, I was talking to a couple of band members right when Ken joined the band and one of them said to me, you know what this means, Mark? And I said, yeah, we got to start taking his suggestion seriously now. <laughs> That's great. But all kidding aside, <laughs> I, I'm sure he's been a great member of the band and it probably felt natural to just have him come in there and, and join in on this album. Right. Oh yeah. He's been incredible. I mean, two days on the road and he was like a brother to us. I mean, he was great. And uh, yeah, we, it was, it's nonstop teasing for new members, but yeah, it's all, it's all good natured. We're, we're all like brothers and have each other's back. It's, it's funny. You mentioned that documentary. We, uh, I use the sink or swim approach, which drives my band members crazy, but I love to do it. It's um, when I force myself to do something and put myself under extreme pressure. So I was flying down to Phoenix to film Ken and Rickard's interviews, and they were the first ones for the documentary. And uh, Rickard said, hey, so you got everything ready to go? And I said, well, I've got a new computer that I just took out of the box. I've got this editing software that I have no idea how to use. And I've got a new camera that I also don't know how to use. Well, how are we going to do this? I'm just going to learn it on the plane. So, wow. And that really works well for me. I just put myself on extreme pressure. And yeah, I've read all the manuals on the flight. And we just hit the ground running when I got there. It's pretty awesome. That's Jump off the ledge and grow your wings on the way down. Yeah. Is that the analogy with the plane? There's a lots of planes. Like, I love this picture uh, that I'm presenting here. Like, and there's a there's a, a couple others on your website or your Facebook where you guys are in the hangar. So what is this plane and what's the significance of it to, to these photo shoots? Well, there's a World War II uh, airplane museum here in Colorado Springs. And it's wonderful. And uh, three of us in the band, you know, the, the three of us that grew up together, John and Harry and myself, we were the sons of military veterans. So we all grew up around the military and we all grew up around going around airplanes and things like that. So we thought it would be a cool, uh, cool throwback. So we called the museum and explained what we wanted to do. And they were super cool. They said, yeah, come on in. If you can do a Sunday, we can uh, clear some space for you and make sure you can get your pictures. And they were wonderful. So, yeah, we got several uh, promo shots out of that airplane museum. Yeah, that's good stuff. And now I can see how it all ties together. Like you're saying, you guys are you know, Colorado origins, you come from military families, the band name comes off of a tank because you lived in Germany, you're, you're shooting videos and doing photo shoots in a, you know, aviation museum, makes perfect sense, coming all in a clarity now. So that's awesome. <laughs> so we want to uh, get into the new album now. And um, I'm going to let Cal jump in here and get his take. But before we do that, there's a couple creatures in the storyline here. I found this image out there and there's also a little snapshot of the comic book. So who are, who are the creatures and how did they come in? Is there something here, the jaw, the swarm, like who are these guys? Yeah, these are the main um, uh, creatures in that, this post-apocalyptic world, the jaws sort of werewolf like, but really more hyena like. And they, uh, they have the ability to to remain perfectly still for hours. They slow their heart rate down, so they will get in an area where they've seen humans go past, and they will just freeze. And when a human walks in, they will pounce down on them. 
and they have an eerie howl, which you can hear on the album at the beginning of the song, Onward We Toil. Yep. And then the, uh, the swarm are giant radioactive bats. They can glow at night as a way of identifying one another. So they inhabit some of the abandoned skyscrapers, which is turned into cliffs. So uh, in the song um, Dark Descent, the team is uh, going down the cliff and they're having to battle these uh, giant radioactive bats. Wow. Wow. Some creative stuff there, man. And all of this is reflected in the comic book. So if you are a fan yeah. of the album and listening to the album, you could also go back and pick up the comic book and it'll just uh, illustrate the story even more so, I would assume. Yep, 100%. In fact, you can see the song titles in the comic book to give you an idea of where we are on the album. Wow. And uh, the, the comic book, I, I think I saw something in the mini documentary. You said um, it was kind of uh, from a from a costing point of view, it was kind of like a financial, you know, not, there's no money to be made, if you, but as pro providing you printed a certain amount of comic books and you sold them, you would at least break even. So is, is the comic book still out there? Is that going to be merch you guys are going to sell on tour and stuff? Or is it kind of like a rarity you'd have to go on eBay and find now? Yeah, it's, it's, I have under 100 left. We did uh, 600 copies and paying the artist and printing them was like uh, 58.92. Wow. For 600 copies. And I, I thought, you know, 10 bucks a copy is, was a little high, but then I, I saw the quality, you know, it's, it's paper like a graphic novel. And I have a, a buddy that's into comics and he said, no, $10 is completely reasonable for this nowadays. Yeah. Sounds like it. Well, we might have to grab ourselves a copy and uh, have the whole story together. So anyway. Yeah. I got to pull some copies out for myself. I haven't grabbed, you know, my own copies. <laughs> you got to get some auto autograph them and get them on the merch booth. But anyway, <laughs> so Cal, let's go into the new album, song by song, the artwork. We're let's go. Jack Panzer's new release, The Hollowed, coming out on June twenty third. Uh, first song, Bound is One. This song just screams classic Jag Panzer. There's a great hook in it. Classic Harry screams going on. The twin leads. I mean, what a great first song to start the album with. It just, it sets the tone. Um, actually, uh, Bound is One describes basically how I feel the, the band was playing at the time and how you all came together for this album, the concept of it all. And, uh, you know, perfect opening for the album, Bound is One here. So and then uh, I think Prey, I think the, the the first two songs are a great one two punch, right? You got Prey comes in next. They're both short songs. They set the tone. Um, I like that spoken word piece in Prey up front. It's like the guy coming in and he's like, we sent scouts out looking for food. And then it kind of tells you all about what's going on here. And it's just got that simple, really strong one word chorus using the yep. word Prey. And uh, it, it's really, really cool. Both of the tracks. So quick in, quick in and out song. Three yeah. minutes, three seconds, knocks your teeth in. That's exactly. all. Exactly. So, Mark, talk about these first songs. Okay. Well, the album starts off. There's actually, it was important to us in this concept that the album started off with a speed up, with a drum speed up in the intro, and the album ends with a slowdown. So that was done on purpose. Bound is one. We wanted something uh, a little heavy and fast and riffy and it's got it's a, a bit unsettling some of the riffs so we wanted to set the tone of the environment so um it, it starts off with a weird machine sound and that's supposed to be the sound of the big cage that's diesel powered that the panthers live in that that right. sort of is driven through so you hear that at the beginning uh lyrically that's you know we're all together as one trying to get through this the animals and the people you know they're not really best friends or anything they just uh there's people trying to get through this together um prey was interesting because uh we talked we wanted it. this is about the uh panthers in the group attacking a family which was so, sort of illustrating the brutality in the story so we wanted a riff that was uh we were calling it the Panthers theme. So we, we wanted it to be a little bit different for a Jag Panzer fan. So it's something we don't really do. It's, it's a riff, 
that has an accent on four, which is not really a traditional metal thing. It's more of a punk thing. And it's, it's really more of uh, like the runaway song, Cherry Bomb has the accent on four. Ah, dun, dun, yeah. dun, 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 dun. And um, punk, um, Agent Orange, Bloodstain has the accent on four. So it was a little bit different riff for us. We decided to further the difference and not have a guitar solo in. Yeah, pretty, 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 pretty cool. And you know what? Uh, jumping into the third song, this is this is one of I love I love ties that bind because you know the first two are great, but this one it's a little bit slower and it's got a different kind of riff. I almost heard a little bit of Iron Maiden esque riffing in there, and uh, I love the you know the typical uh, power metal. We stand strong, all for one, wall for all, feel. You know, I could sure see this one being a crowd pleaser in Germany, you know, fists in the air at the European festivals. So I, I like that that one was a nice kind of bridge to, let's say, the singles that come up next. So we'll talk about Ties That Bind. What's that one mean to you? Well, um, lyrically, this was something that the animals are really seeing everybody as a team. Like we're a family and we're a group. So everything we're going through is is all binding us together so that's what that's doing uh, lyrically um musically we wanted to take it down a couple notches from the first two and sort of uh give it like a mid tempo like a almost like a, a dio type pace to it wanted a strong chorus um nice harmony guitars in that and this was actually our the last song we mixed on the album and Traditionally, with albums, you mix the good songs first, and then the last song you mix is uh, the worst song. But this was the last song mixed. I remember producer Jim Morris said, this is the best song. You saved it for last. This is incredible. Yeah, he loves that song. That was his favorite song on the record. And I think that's our singer, Harry. That's one his top three favorite, I think. is It's in the top three, Ties the yeah. Bind. Yeah, it's, it's a good one. And it's, it's placed perfectly after the first two quick fast ones and then you got that one placed in and then you go into the singles and then the back end is unique in and of itself so hey cal uh i think you were you don't wanted to bring up the artwork uh what do you uh, want to talk to mark about the artwork well we have the graphic of the hollowed up um i believe it was done by dusan markovic yep the album cover and he has ties with uh angel witch and virgin steel and as a matter of fact, how you were mentioning Virgin Steel, um, were you guys friends with Jack Star? Familiar with Jack Star? I know you did a cover. Of, oh, I'm uh, actually very good friends with Jack. Yeah, yeah. Jack's a great guy. I've known Jack for 25 years. Yeah, Jack's awesome. He um he is actually a friend of mine. He lives here in town where I live in Melbourne, Florida. And I just actually texted Verno on the side that I just missed a call from him. He's probably going to be stopping in. I own a restaurant down here out on the beach side at Indian Harbor Beach. And um, him and his wife are probably going to be coming in to see. So after that show here, I'll have to get a hold of him. He's, he's a great guy. I've sat down with uh, Kenny Earl and uh, uh, the bass player, Ned Maloney. Great, great guys. And uh, I not uh, noticed that they... Yeah, Jack's you know, awesome. I remember... Uh... I, I played his uh, his Out of the Darkness solo album to death. I mean, I just played it over and over again. Yeah, Jack's Jack's been one of my favorites forever. I'll, I'll tell him you said hello when I talk to him. Okay. We'll contact you. A little get together again. Awesome. But Mark, hey, what about the uh, the actual graphics on the album? Like, I love the album cover. And then when you get into the singles, I, I love how you guys actually did specific artwork for all three singles because each one of them has a certain animal associated with the songs so talk about the cover art first well the cover art we uh we just wanted to pick two characters so um contrary to what people may think that is not the main character the, the man is named wolf and the uh dog is named tahoe and they are not they're just two characters they're not the main characters we wanted to kind of show some some separation in the group these group are the group of people are not best friends they're not related they're just people surviving together so we wanted to pick one person and one animal alone for the cover 
And uh, yeah, I, I love Dusan's artwork. He's one of my favorite artists. I grew up really into Boris Vallejo and Frank Frazetta. And I think that uh, Dusan is in that league. And so I was really happy that he was able to do this cover. And it's so cool, too, because as you were talking about before, the whole concept in like the post apolitic world and it's a fro everything is frozen too right and it's like as you said the buildings yeah. turn into something else cliffs but i mean how badass is that it's like downtown denver snowed over a bus a car collided snowed over buildings yet little ray of hope in there with the sunshine coming through really really freaking cool well done on that yep so uh, in getting into the uh, the singles, right, and and I want to share my thoughts on these songs, but um, I mean, just look at the the graphics behind this. I mean, you know, you know, applause all the way around. Well done here. But these songs, man, they're they're all three of them are great on their own, right? I mean, stronger than you know. It was the first single. Um, that main guitar rift almost to me sounds like if you were to hear hear eagles or birds flying above it's them screeching and i love the simplicity of that riff because it illustrates the birds but it's also just a bad freaking riff and it's just a cool song and it, it kind of speeds up the pace um has that metal chant chorus great job there onward we toil this is a good one too because it's got that melodic chorus some, one that you can remember as you take it away and it seems to me about like Kind of like the people and the animals kind of unifying and staying strong together and they're starting their fight. They know the back's against the wall, but they got to fight through adversity. So talk a little bit about these two songs. Well, can I interrupt you one second? Um, Absolutely. Uh, Jack, are you there? Yeah, I'm listening. Oh, guys, can you hear? I got Jack Starr on the yeah. line. Hey, Jack, how's it going? Good to hear your voice. I love the new album. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, man. It's all it's all good. Yep. This is like a total coincidence, you know. I I was calling John and he said, Hey, guess who I have on on the show? So I was like, Oh, cool. Sorry, Jack, I couldn't pick up your call at the moment. And I was I was anxious to tell you who I was talking to when I when I called you after the interview here. We were yeah. just talking about you too when when you called, which is total coincidence. The metal gods for sure. Yeah, 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 Jack. I was just telling them, I was telling them what an influence you are on me. I mean, man, I've I've loved your music forever. Oh, uh, that's so nice to say that, you know. And I'm a big Jack Panzer fan, also. I, well, I appreciate know, that. Why. Well, you both yeah. go back to the heyday, and it's a testament to your careers that you're here. We are 2023, and you're both putting out quality releases and it still have your fingerprint on metal in 2023 so hell yeah yeah because metal will never die that's right thanks jack uh well we'll let you get back to the beach jack i'll All call right, you back jack. Here, brother. i'll call you back thanks. after the interview thanks man boy hey, that good is, talk uh, that's the metal metal connection right there that's just thanks, such cool yeah, yeah that's cool there's the uh, there's the eagle bringing in eagle coming in from the uh, the the beaches in Florida, right. dropping Jack Star onto our lap. So anyway, Mark, go back to the singles. Let's hear about these singles. Well, um, yeah, we are adamant. Well, we had you know we always have band meetings on everything, and we were adamant that uh, we didn't want the record company using any of the album starters as singles or the album enders. So you know, pick some stuff in the middle. It's uh, God, I just I get tired of a, a band's lead single being the first song on the album. It's like, oh, come on again. So we wanted to do something different. Um, we wanted to do covers for the singles, even though they're not physically released. We wanted to to show people what, uh, you know, what single covers are like. So we did single covers for each one. Uh, the artwork was interesting because I. I I didn't want to hire artists to do individual covers. We didn't really have the time and that the expense would have been high. So I, I hired an artist to do just the monsters. And um, 
and the monsters and the eagles and then i went ahead and i'm the one that put them together for the cover so i, I certainly wouldn't call myself the artist i guess i'm the graphic designer on the covers i guess right. um yeah. musically yeah it's hard for me to talk about them as singles because musically they just fit the part in the story that they're supposed to fit i love the bats I love those bats oh yeah those are cool there's actually an unreleased lyric video for Edge of a Knife that has them animated that the record company didn't like, so it didn't get released. But I'm bugging them to release it anyway. Well, let's talk about that first single that you released, Stronger Than You Know. Uh, boy, talk about a great first release. This was like hopping into the Jag Panzer 1969 Chevelle starting the engine and then the anticipation of what's to come. Uh, it really got the motor running being that first release and our first new Jag Panzer. Uh, it was just great, great first release. Thank you. There's uh, some interesting trivia about that. Um, when we started the Hallowed, we thought, um, can we play uh pay a few tributes on the record to other people and also tributes to our early career. So graphically, um, during Stronger Than You Know in the comic book, you see the Eagles kill five men and the, the men in the comic book are the band members, which is sort of a tip of the hat to our first EP where this woman warrior had killed the band members. So we thought, okay, well, that's a visual representative. Let's do an audio one. So Actually, the arrangement of Stronger Than You Know is very, very similar to the arrangement of Warfare from Ample Destruction. And that was purposely done. So riffs are very different. Structure is very different. But if you listen to them both, the actual arrangement is one is definitely a tribute to the other. Awesome. Well, looking on and moving on here, the next uh, song, Onward We Toil. I this is probably my favorite song off the album. After my second listen through the album, I found myself singing along to this song. Uh, the chorus, especially, great hook. It's got a sick grind to it. Just a, a great sing along tune, like almost anthem esque, uh, to say the least about the song. Great song. Oh, thank you. That's that song is actually controversial with the opinions, uh, which is is odd to me. I found uh, a thread on the internet where, you know, people were saying, "Oh, here's Jag Panzer trying to be Ailstorm or Sabaton, and this is so trendy." And I, I don't chime in on anything like that. That would be weird. But they just didn't understand what this is. This is a work song. This is everybody together singing that chorus. Oh. oh, oh yeah exactly and, what i did you know there's work songs with pirates there's work songs i mean in in snow white and the seven dwarf soundtrack the first hi record ho, I ho. Before. yeah there's hi ho hi ho so you know there when you're talking about this type of story there has to be a work song so that's the work song there you go that was a great one uh moving on here we're going to look at uh onward we, we just talked about onward we toil we got edge of a knife at the beginning of that song, um, it sounds like what is Morris Code playing out. But then when the band comes in, they're playing that Morris Code, too. Is that actual Morris Code? And if it is, what is it saying? It's help in Morris Code. So right. that is actual Morris Code. And I, I know somebody that knows Morris Code very well. And I played him the song and he said, help, <laughs> you got it right. That was funny because writing Morse code that's in time with music is really, really difficult. It took me all day. But then once you hear it, you know, I told my band members how hard it was. It took each of them five minutes to do it. And they're like, Mark, this isn't hard at all. Da, 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 da. And I said, well, you didn't write it. I mean, writing it and getting the timing is, uh, is a little more difficult than just mimicking it and playing your part. So I'm not sure if they still believe me. <laughs> but we we initially weren't going to play the Morse code, but we thought, you know, we're we're all giant Rush fans. So we thought maybe it's just a, a little bit of a tribute to Neil Peart if we uh, play the Morse code, because that's a tip of the hat to YYZ, the classic Rush yeah. song. Yeah, great. I, I think um, 
the song might have been different had you left it out. I like the fact that you included that Morse code in there in the beginning of that and that you connected the two together. And it's interesting to know it means help. That's awesome. Well, it also it also comes back at the end of the song, too. And I think it it leads itself right into the remainder of the other songs because everyone has sort of their own story behind it. Um, Hey, Mark, I what I thought was cool about Edge and Knife was um, the video. Right. Whereas the other two videos, they were they were very graphic and uh, almost like a storyline with some some really cool imagery and the lyrics up. That one was cool because it was just like the LP on a turntable and you had the little like the little lyrics coming across a little ribbon at the bottom, almost something really, really old. Or maybe that was the message like it would come out in Morse code. So I see the thought process you put behind it and it was really, really well done. Yeah, I wanted to do so. I did that lyric video and I wanted to do something different. And I was thinking about my uh, my stereo system in the late 80s and it had a uh, sort of meter that looked just like that. And it had the name of the release would come across an LED. So I wanted to do just uh, basic kind of 80s era imagery, a turntable, the album cover, exactly the way I would listen to, you know, a record is uh, take the vinyl out, put the sleeve down. And then, you know, I put that display in there from my old stereo. So uh, just, you know, cool 80s imagery is what I wanted to get out of that. Yeah, you guys did a great job at that. I mean, I I hope that when our listeners are listening or watching this video, you could see how much effort and time the guys in the band put to this album. I mean, it's a credit to you guys because I I don't listen. Everybody puts new music out, but you guys have put a lot of effort into your materials, your promoting, your videos, and uh, it shows on the end product, but it's more than just the music. It's the whole package. But Hey, listen, Mark, you know, the album is 10 songs. I mean, the rest of the album, we could talk all day about the album. You got songs, Dark Descent, Weather the Storm, Renewed the Flame. And, you know, my favorite, or at least the way the album ends, the last song, Last Rites. I mean, this is like an epic track. It's long. You got the spoken word up front. You know, it's, uh, I, and I coined the lyric, we have found what we are, we sought but found it was much more than we imagined. And and the first time I listened to it, I didn't actually know what was going to, the storyline. I'm thinking, oh my God, this is going to end bad. And then you kind of hear those demonic last rites chants, the tribal drum beats, and then the bells. And then there's like the midsection where it's like, like you said, it almost feels like it's out of a, a an adventure movie. Like it felt like there was a war going on in the middle of the song. And then you got the shredding coming in. And then around that eight minute mark, it fades out and I'm like, well, what is going on okay. here? Is there, is there going to be like a, a succession to this story that we don't know how it ends? And then you had to stay with the song because then the lady with the kids come in, you hear the animals and the kids talking. And it's like the whole point where the lady says, kids, we're talking about a tale two, 200 seasons back. And it's almost like it was a fairy tale. And, you know, the world was saved. And it becomes a happy ending. So, man, I was just, I felt so great at the end of listening to that song. Like, I felt like I was along the mission with you guys. So, talk about Last Rites. Yeah, we wanted to, uh, we wanted to capture the last part of the story, which was really powerful. It's the animals finally saying, We've had enough. We're going to leave. They'd been through so much together. And when they find paradise, which is the hallowed and in, in the comic book, you have latitude, longitude written on a note that one of the characters have. And that's actually the, the uh, location of the island Curacao, which is my favorite tropical island that I'm going oh, wow. there in two weeks. So cool. That's in the comic book. So the animals are, you know, they, they've been through a lot. They're neglected. They're, they're at this new place and humans don't really need them anymore. So it was a big conflict. So we wanted to build up around the fireplace and the uh, the weird murmurs are just that's the animals just hearing the people just talking differently. And, you know, it's everybody. It's just chatter, and, which didn't happen before. Friendly chatter, and that's what that's what it sounds like to the animals. It's sort of different and weird. And then there's the build up where uh, you know one of the panthers attacks the the guy on the album cover, but backs off the attack, doesn't kill him, and then the animals just leave. So we're trying to 
address all this musically. And the interesting part musically in the song is the very first melodic guitar solo. I mean, I haven't done a guitar solo since the 80s. I'm just not into doing them. It's just not, not my thing. So I'm trying to describe to the rest of the band what that guitar solo is supposed to sound like, and nobody's getting it. And I'm saying, look, it's got to be like this. So I finally pick up my guitar and I just play that solo. And everybody in the band said, okay, well, let's just use that one. So yeah, what you hear on the album, the first guitar solo is me playing it, just trying to show everybody what I wanted that solo to be. So that actually made the album, which was really weird. So Did you um, keep first take. Yeah, yeah, that's that's like the version I was like, played everybody what it's supposed to be yeah that's it on the album there you go it's a it's a great way to end the album man and uh like i said the whole body of work is is impressive and every every song stand on its own and they all have its individual story but it's the body of work that makes it so uh, a job well done and uh, best of luck and success on the album um, before we let you go, we got a couple things we didn't want to go away because we want to give you a chance to talk about your touring so I see you're going to be over in Europe this summer. Looks like some dates yep. in Germany. Um, you're going to be playing the Alcatraz Festival in Belgium, which from what I hear is yep. like a kick-ass like festival. Like I know Belgium has grass pop, but this one comes in a couple months later, and apparently it's just as good, just a little bit smaller. So talk about your touring plans, yeah. and you know, will you guys end up in the States at all? Are we going to be able to see the show? And how do you put a set list together? And how much of the new album are you going to be you're going to be putting in there? Well, we're going to be doing about three or four songs from the new album. Um, yeah, this this is, you know, us doing some festivals and some really cool, cool club shows in between. We have uh, Headbangers Open Air, which is a you know classic, cool metal festival. We're playing over there. We're playing it with uh, Riots playing, Vicious Rumors. So that's going to be a cool gig. We've got some uh, club dates in there. Uh, really cool ones like the Oldenburg MTS is held in a record store. I mean, it's really a cool record store and they just push the records aside for the band to play. We've done it once and that's great. Uh, We've got Vakken. This is our third time there. That's the monster metal festival and it is awesome to play. And we've got some more club gigs. We're playing for our our buddy Renee, who's longtime friend of the band. He's promoting the Swiss show, uh, Netherlands show and Uden's going to be great. And then we're at Alcatraz and back home. And then we've got, uh, U.S. Festival in Wisconsin, Blades of Steel with uh, with Riot again, um, uh, Floss and Jetsam. I mean, that's going to be a really cool day. So these are going to be fun shows. Uh, when you say Riot, Rick, is this Rick Ventura's version, the Riot the Riot Act? No, we're actually playing with Riot Act, though. The date okay. isn't on that graphic, and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but we have, we have a one-off in Europe with Riot Act. Okay. which is it's going to be really cool to meet Rick Ventura because I've been a Riot fan since Rock City, you know, and Narita, Fire Down yeah. Under. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be exciting to meet Rick. Those we, guys uh, are We're big Riot. advocates of Riot Act. We've had Rick on the show a couple of times, and uh, John oh, cool. did a show promoting them up in Rochester back in the uh, autumn. So, uh, oh, yeah, we got a little bit of history with Rick. He's a, he's a really cool guy. Just saw him a few weeks ago up at a show oh, at the cool. Chance in Poughkeepsie. So hey, while we're talking about uh, you mentioned playing with Flotsam and Jetsam, um, the bass and drum production was done by Flotsam and Jetsam drummer Ken Mary. Uh, tell us a little about that. Yeah. I mean, that guy is a sick drummer. I had the chance to meet him at a show in Orlando, just like an octopus back there playing the drums. He's just nuts. Yeah, he's he's a world class drummer and he's just as good of an engineer as he is a drummer. He's got a great studio outside of phoenix he's got a big drum room he's uh you know great to work with yeah drums and bass came out great and you know a part of the reason it came out great was ken mary behind the desk yeah he's a he's a great guy just as acknowledges uh with as much legend as the jim morris from morris sound which was where everything was mixed on this album yeah, we wanted to mix old school analog, so uh, we did not want to mix in the computer. Wanted to mix on a biz- big desk, and no better, no better place to do that w- uh, than uh, Morris Sound with Jim Morris. Oh, man, if the walls could talk in that studio, the bands that have yeah. been there, Nasty Savage, we just yep. uh, talk up just about a few, but great stuff. 
Hey, Mark, before I let you go, I uh, went down to the end of my vaults and it's, it's extensive vaults down in my uh, basement. And I did come up with one of these Iron Maiden Christmas cards. I don't know if you oh, guys can well, cool. see that. <laughs> you know, it's uh, yeah, you're right. You really can't see it with this, but um, uh, yeah, I did get some of those Christmas cards. So, I guess um, I guess I got to get involved with the Jag Panzer uh hotline and Christmas cards. But uh, I let the guys say goodbye. Uh, great album, okay. Fantastic band, and best of luck this summer. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Well, Mark, before we <laughs> let you go. We yeah. always like to end the segment on a, something a little fun and personal. So we uh, we pulled these pictures out. I don't know when they're from, how old you were, but uh, talk a little bit about these. See if you picture remember the, when they're from. Yeah, picture on the left was our very, very first gig. We were high school students. Um, I was a sophomore in high school, and Harry and John were juniors. Um, yeah, we were playing uh, cover. That was a, a high school talent show, and we were playing uh, – Led Zeppelin's rock and roll. Um, The picture on the right is probably 1984 uh, up in Denver. I think we were opening up for Grim Reaper at the Rainbow Music Hall. I've got my Exciter shirt on, which I wore probably three days a week. (laughs) Another great band. Yep. That's awesome. And I I, I see there you, you had a full head of hair. You still have a full head of hair, so it's all good. Yeah, yeah, not quite as as full, but it's okay. <laughs> and I like how your bass player in the photo, it looks like he's got uh, maybe a, a Heaven and Hell or a Mob Rule shirt on there. I can't really tell, but it uh, yeah, probably, probably would have been, uh, been, right? been Heaven and Hell. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm yeah. loving that Rickenbacker killer bass, yep. 4001. Nice. Yep, that is 4001, right. Mark, I just want to say you guys um, – you're still doing what you're doing. You're still knocking it out of the park. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. The fans appreciate it. Um, the hotline, just everyone needs a hotline. The picks, the dog tags, everything you guys do is geared towards the fans. Um, we appreciate that as being fans of yours. Um, great album. Good luck over in Europe with the tour. And it would be great. Uh, you know, the logistics of touring now are just phenomenal so would uh you yep. know maybe we could get some u.s dates that would be great to be able to see jag panzer again and thank you for joining us today oh that would be fun thanks for and sorry for playing with my nose during the front my sinuses are itching like crazy <laughs> that's it's all good uh, i can't okay. uh, couldn't have sent it better uh thank you cal for the uh the exit and mark best of luck and I hope to see you guys in Jersey and New York someday. And uh, we'll be watching and rooting for me on the sidelines. Okay. Thank you very much. This was fun. Ah, uh, great, man. Well, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch and uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, bye. Cheers. Metal for Life. Thank you for listening to Metal Mayhem ROC. Check out our website at MetalMayhemROC.com for information on podcasts, archives, links to all our live radio shows, and all sorts of info. Please like, follow, and share with everyone, even your non-metal friends. And always remember to keep it heavy.